Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, we meet here on Zoom to learn more about photography and to connect, inspire and create with the help of a guest that shares their images, their stories that give us some insight in their photography process and some tips to help us all improve our photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. My guest tonight is Rob Doyle. Rob is a Texas-based landscape photographer who is named by TexasHighways.com as one of the top 25 Texas travel photographers to follow on Instagram. Rob's work has been featured by numerous travel websites, such as the Texas Tourism Board and Texas State Parks. And in tonight's presentation, Capturing the Magic of West Texas, Rob will share his stories and show you some of the most amazing landscapes of West Texas. The starry skies, a little bit of Texas history, as well as anecdotes from his travel adventures across the least populated part of the Lone Star State. If you're on Instagram, look for him at Pluto911 and on his website, Pluto911.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Rob. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm I'm, okay. Well. well, I'm in Costa Rica, so uh, we kind of set that up just a little bit. If I lose um, connection, I've got somebody that's going to jump in for me. And um, if you lose connection, we're pretty much screwed. But uh, <laughs> so don't, so don't do that. All right. I did a super, super, just I skimmed the top of Rob Doyle, the photographer, my friend. So is there something that you'd like for the, for the class to know about you? What did I miss? And I think you covered it all, actually. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, West Texas, a lot of big, big band, but some West Texas Guadalupe. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, as Linda mentioned, I'm a landscape and travel photographer. I'm based in Austin, Texas. I've lived here, gosh, over 20 years now. Um, I bought my first camera a zillion years ago, it feels like. I had a research grant to live in Barcelona. And when during that time, I tried to document my travels because I knew that it was just this once in a lifetime opportunity that was never going to come again. So uh, that had a lot of effect on kind of my personal style that I'm really interested in, like the natural world, our effect on it, and especially like the passage of time and how, uh, and things that will never come again, uh, whether that just be the way um, the sky looks after a rainstorm or ruins on a landscape or whatever like that. I feel like in another life, I would have been a photojournalist or something, but um, it didn't work out that way. So that's what, that's about me. Um, me and Big Band. Uh, Big Band in particular, I know I'm going to talk about other things, but I've been going out to West Texas pretty much all my entire life, um, over 30 years, I think. My first trip was in seventh grade and uh, we went out to Guadalupe Mountains. I was spring break with my family, went out to Guadalupe Mountains. We camped, we hiked Guadalupe Peak. Um, I didn't use sunscreen because it was the eighties and y'all sunscreen. Um, I was so sick. I was so sunburned and just so sick the entire trip. And so when I rolled into Big Bend, um, like I could barely remember the place. I was so sick, like dad, pull over so I can puke out the side of the window, kind of sick. And that despite all that, it just made this huge impression on me. Like I'd never seen anything like it. It lives something out of a Western, like all these huge wide open spaces and blue skies and crazy cactus. Uh, I had grown up in the Pacific Northwest in Canada. And so it was just totally different than any landscapes I'd ever seen growing up. And so it just really had this profound effect on me. And since then I've come back just countless times, like literally countless, I've lost track, um, 15, 20, I don't know. but. I've been out to Big Bend in West Texas pretty much through every phase of my life. Um, it's just been this huge constant. And so tonight I'm hoping to show and share just some of the things that uh, just really draw me to it that keep me coming back. And so for the presentation tonight, I've broken it down into five different sections. 
Um, one is just the history of the place. It's, there's a long history stretching back to geological time, which I'm not gonna cover that, but um, just the alienness of it, you know, everything wants to poke you. Uh, it's just, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the sweeping views that are just everywhere out there, um, just the ability to have fun and excitement and adventure, and also just the night sky is, is unbelievable. Um, I'm assuming a lot of folks have been out there. If, if you don't live in Texas, maybe you haven't, but um, in, the, in the comments, in the chats, if you wouldn't mind, just say who else been out there or not. That'd be really interesting to see um, how many folks have actually made it out there. Cause I've definitely met lots of uh, Texans who have just never driven out there. It's, it's eight, 10, 12 hours from Houston. Um, it's about seven hours from Austin. You know, it, it's quite a hike to get out to that region, to Big Bend and Terlingua in particular. Um, so it'd be interesting to see who's done that. So part one, um, history. So the nice thing about being a desert arid climate is that history is just really on display. Like if you're a geologist, you can see millions of years of uh, volcanoes and dinosaurs and oceans and all sorts of stuff. Um, that's not my bag. I'm not a geologist, but I'm more interested in the human aspect of it. I'm a huge, huge history buff. Um, I have a master's in medieval history and I have a master's in library and information science. And so just the historical stuff just really just tickles my fancy. And if we were to jump back in time, like 10,000 years ago, the climate out there, surprisingly, was a lot cooler and wetter, um, similar to the forests that we see high up in the Chisos and the Guadalupes. And eventually the area became a lot more hotter and more arid. Um, which is definitely how it was when the first recorded history started in the 1500s. Um, although Native Americans had lived out there for thousands of years, and we still see evidence of that throughout the region in uh, pictogly pictoglyphs in particular, which are um, kind of carvings into the rock. Although we definitely also see some paintings like these little hands in this rock shelter up there. Um, there's also mortar holes everywhere, which I don't think I have a great picture of that, but those are like little grinding areas. Um, which are just all throughout, throughout the area. Um, <clears throat> this picture is actually in Seminole Canyon. And this is one of the better publicly accessible cave paintings in the state. And this one in particular really drew me because of that figure in the center. Um, I don't know if you can quite make it out, but it's got this kind of upright human figure with like hands upraised and an eye and some antlers and no mouth. And, uh, it just reminds me when I was a kid, my grandmother in Canada was like this very prim and proper high school principal, you know, lady. And for whatever reason, she had all these crazy, like aliens built the pyramids books like laying around her house. And so like one of those books had a picture of some cave painting somewhere. And it's like these figures with no mouths. And like, I just remember as a kid that just like horrified me and gave me all these vivid, vivid nightmares. And so, um, when I saw this one, it just terrified me actually. So I, I keep it around just to remind me of the horror of that, that memory, but it's also kind of eerie and beautiful too. Uh, the first ranchers started moving into the area and Big Bend in the 1880s. It might've been a little earlier for other parts of West Texas, but Big Bend was definitely the 1880s. And back in those days, it was a lot more grassy. Um, especially in, in the national park than it is today. Um, it, was never, it was never lush, it was never green as far as um, we would think of grasslands today, but there was definitely more areas to graze back then. And so a lot of ranches got set up with cattle and goats, and then they quickly overgrazed within 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so those ranches started failing. So bad news for them, um, good news for us today because uh, Back in the 20s and 1920s, 1930s, there was a movement to create a Texas state park called Texas Canyon State Park. And so people from the Texas park started buying up these failing ranches and uh, the state park never got off the ground, but then that got turned over to the park service, the national park service, which eventually led to Big Bend. So um, ecological disaster over there, but national park for us. So um, that was actually really great in that sense. This cow actually was in Marfa um, and I was just driving on the side of the road. I was trying to take a picture of the white cow, which is kind of over like the left shoulder there. And then this guy, he just didn't like the looks of me at all. So he came charging, running towards me. And so 
Um, the picture is actually a little blurry because I was still kind of like, oh crap, when I uh, when I when I took the picture. But yeah, he and I we turned out to be friends. You see, he, he was nice. So this picture, this is with uh, dugout wells in uh, in the in big band, and so this was a site of a uh, school. There's a there was a public school back in those days, and like I find that really incredible too. Just the devotion for education that was going on. Like it wasn't easy at all. There was like people would have to travel for a long time. Like one of the teachers was also a rancher, and so allegedly they would he would get on his horse and leave his ranch on, you know, Sunday night. He'd ride to dugout wells. He'd teach Monday through Friday. He'd get on his horse, he'd ride back Saturday and then repeat it all over again. So it was this long, huge um, journey that they'd have to go on. And so, uh, I mean, it just seemed like so much work. And so I'm just really, I was always really impressed that the folks out there had such dedication to education that they'd go through all the sacrifice, not to mention all the students and the kids and the families that would, have to bring their kids for miles and miles around. So um, I'm just really impressed by that. <clears throat> so this is uh, Terlingua Cemetery. So in the early 1900s, the uh, kind of the Trans-Pecos, the big band region started having this boom in cinnabar, which was uh, the ore from which mercury is derived. And so it started being mined commercially, oh gosh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, 1920s, and all throughout World War I. By that time, this area was the biggest producer of mercury in the world. And this area had, had all these booms and busts um, until it finally collapsed in the 1940s. So <clears throat> it's the cemetery itself is um, it's just hauntingly beautiful. Uh, a lot of the graves are unmarked. Uh, there's still families in the area, so they know who they are. They, they know the graves, but uh, just these small, simple, rustic graves um, out there in the wilderness is just really, uh, it's just really a moving place. I try to go out there whenever I go out there and just uh, have some quiet time in the cemetery. It's just really a beautiful place. Um, there's also a mine deep, deep inside the interior of Big Bend National Park, the Mariscal Mine. And today this is on the register of national historical places. And it has a bunch of, well, open mine shafts. So that's not, you know, be careful if you go to visit out there, but um, there's still some mining equipment and mining buildings and mining cabins laying around. And they make for a really great um, like location for photos. Uh, this was a ruined cabin um, and it's interesting looking at the construction of this one, which is just kind of loose dry stacked stones with some riverbed mortar in there, uh, compared to this guy, which was probably a foreman's cabin, I think. And it's hard to tell from the pictures, but uh, this is actually like poured concrete and it had a cement, um, the poured concrete cement, and it had like a porch and a patio on the side and had windows and like, it was just really, a lot of work went into this. And so uh, I guess whenever, whenever I go out there, I just try to imagine what life was like for the guys working at the, at the mine here. And uh, I mean, it just took a lot of work in there. So this, this picture is not the greatest photo in the world, but it's actually one of my favorites. Um, Cause it just, it just, I don't know, just evokes this sense of remoteness. Um, that I get whenever I go down to the mine and see a lot of the, and see any of the abandoned sites, which are common throughout the region, just because it's so arid, it preserves things so well. Um, and so, yeah, every time I get to, I just kind of get lost it on. I don't know, I just, I just really, I'm drawn to this picture. Um, so it's hard to talk about like the history of the region without talking about the frontier. Um, both from the point of view of like the westward expansion of the US across like the continent, as well as the frontier with Mexico. And so the Rio Grande, it's been an international border for, you know, since the mid 1800s. Um, but both sides, but, but residents on both sides would kind of cross back and forth freely, uh, treating the border as more of an abstract concept instead of like a real boundary that governed their lives. And it's interesting to note that 
when the first Anglos started settling and expanding into the area, they encountered families who had lived there for hundreds of years. Um, unfortunately, it's not really recorded. So it's um, at least that I could find easily that uh, like their experiences, but that, uh, that it's hard to imagine for us, it's such a remote and rugged place that people just live there for hundreds of years, ranching and farming and uh, you know, just living out their lives, which is really interesting to me. This is a picture of Santa Elena Canyon, which anyone who knows me knows I have an ambivalent relationship with this canyon. I uh, like everybody and their dog loves it. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I feel like it's something I have to go and see, but I don't particularly, <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll say anymore. It's a beautiful place. Um, but this is standing in the middle of the river and uh, it's just so easy to cross over and back and forth. I'm glad that the uh, border crossings back over and open, not here, but um, it's easy enough to go back across um, over on the other side of the park, which is really interesting to do. And I highly recommend if you do visit the park, bring your passport and take advantage of it. So this is a picture of uh, Castellon, which is on the west side of Big Bend National Park. And by the 1880s, there were over 40 forts in Texas. Many of them were established in the 1840s and 1850s uh, to protect migration routes and trade routes across the West. Um, the Army started establishing more of a presence in Big Bend in the early 1900s, especially after violence started spreading across the border from the Mexican Revolution. Uh, during this time in 1916, there was a raid on a little village called Glen Springs that killed several civilians and soldiers, um, <clears throat> which eventually got known, became known as the Glen Springs Massacre. And that prompted the government to really just sit up and take notice around that other, that same time, there are some other attacks in that area as well. And so this camp, this uh, fort um, was started and uh, it was called Camp St. Helena, but it was never really occupied. And so all the soldiers and cavalry um, troops who were building it. They were forced to live in tents and uh, live outdoors while all these buildings were constructed. Um, but then by the time they were finished, they were needed elsewhere and so they left. And so I, I, I imagine these poor guys, like they're building all these things, living in these tents. And then by the time they're finally ready to move inside and have a bed and have a roof over their head, um, they gotta go someplace else, but um, they're still here today. There's been a fire that burnt and damaged the old barracks, which was the site of a uh, general store, but um, there's still parts of it that are still around today. So just kind of like a fun fact, um, my brother and I, who my brother Mike, who's been out with me on a bunch of these trips, we camped out near the ruins of, the, of Glen Springs where that massacre was. And we set up camp that night. And as we were kind of sitting around our campsite, we saw these lights kind of bobbing down the road and we thought, oh, somebody's lost. So we tried finding them, uh, just waiting for them to show up and they never showed up. And we thought, you know, well, that's, that's kind of weird. Um, and then a couple minutes later, we noticed some other lights on a ridge far away. And they seemed to be moving back and forth to another set of lights um, that was maybe a couple hundred yards from us. And we also started noticing every time we moved, like the lights started moving too. And we just started getting more and more spooked. And so as like darkness came down, um, we kept seeing these darn lights bobbing around. And so we were just like, I don't know what this is, if that's... Uh, somebody's lost out there or what, but we just like freaked out. So we just threw all our stuff into his truck and um, took off. Then a couple of years later, I was talking to someone and they mentioned they had seen lights out there as well. And that some other people had as well, that uh, similar in the same way that Marfa has its ghost lights. Uh, it sounds like there's some ghost lights that show up around this area of the park too, which I don't get because it seems like the ghost lights are really just <laughs> reflections of highway lights, but who knows what this was? It scared the bejesus out of us, that's for sure. And this is the final picture. This is just a little traffic jam. Um, this is actually Big Bend Ranch State Park. And uh, just one time I took, I was driving out there and I took a wrong turn and I ended up just on this back road and all of a sudden there's this herd of longhorns. And so I was just stuck behind them. And then eventually, you can't see it up, but the very front, there's kind of this old mama longhorn. 
she uh, just kind of like cut everybody off the road. And so I could pass them and they got back on the road after me and went on their business. So smart cows. Thanks, mama. All right, part two, stabby, stabby. <clears throat> so I'm always fascinated by just how harsh and unforgiving this place is. Um, like I'm amazed at the people, the plants, the animals that all lived and adapted here. It's just like I mentioned earlier, it's just so alien from what I grew up with, which was a lot more humid and green. Um, cactus in particular, I just find really fascinating. And so this is a picture on a trail called the Dodson Trail. And you can see it's a little bird nest built into cactus. And because, you know, there's no trees out there. So they have to make do and do what they do. So on uh, this, this guy just built this nest on this, this cactus here. And uh, like I said, I'd like the cactus. They, uh, um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors. Uh, I love the purple cactus. I don't have a great picture of a purple cactus, which I should probably take care of that someday. But um, so many types and varieties, all of them, you know, will prick you and stab you and hurt you. But this particular picture, this one's for the haters um, who say like, dudes never see heart-shaped cactus, man. We see it. We just, we just play cool. Um, we don't get so excited, but it's definitely heart face. It's also the, the landscape just really lends itself for black and white photography. And so this is taken near the old ore road in Big Bend National Park. And uh, this, was, this is a case where this is just a really dreary and terrible overcast day. And so in color, this picture is just not great, but um, <laughs> when it gets converted into black and white, it's just magically becomes better. Um, same thing with this one. This is Grapevine Hills, uh, where there's a balanced rock in Big Bend National Park, where there's tons and tons of people take pictures there. But I feel like the valley itself is a lot more interesting than um, the balanced rock. Like, there's just so many crazy rock formations. They look like little monsters or Godzillas and boulders. Um, yeah, it's just really a fascinating place. And this is likewise, um, this was taken maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. And so the light was just brutally harsh um, when I took this picture. And this is Elephant Tusk, which is my second most favorite named mountain. Um, this was also seen from the Dodson Trail. But once converted to black and white, it just has such a lot more um, interest than um, that's just the nasty washed out color was in the original photo. Likewise, this one, this was early morning on Pink Gap Road, which is uh, one of the kind of, un, it, it's maintained, but it's a dirt road in the park, in that in Big Bend National Park, um, which with all the creosote and the mountains and the dirt is just, uh, I, I just found it really compelling, um, this landscape. But also this one, um, this is the Rio Grande River. And so I just find this really stark and beautiful. And, and the lighting was great that morning, which helped as well. But um, uh, just like the shapes of the plants and the rocks, I just find really, really interesting. And uh, I just never get tired of seeing them. And the storms out there are great too. This was actually Palo Duro. Um, Canyon, which is closer to the Panhandle than West Texas, but um, it's just an amazing place for watching storms roll in, especially in the summer months when this one was taken in June. And uh, in the Big Bend region, June and July are where a lot of the rain happens. And so those are great times to see summer storms and lightning and uh, well, flash flooding if you're not careful, but um, just these really amazing displays that uh, you only see a couple times a year. So um, it's a great, it's hotter than blazes. It is so hot out there, but during that time of year, but it's great for storm watchers and storm chasers to see um, the weather rolling in then. <clears throat> and this is Soto Vista, which is in Big Bend. Um, and for me, this has like the encapsulation of all the stuff. It has this great sun and mountains, Soto cactus, harsh, beautiful. It's just, uh, it's just absolutely my favorite place in the park. Um, it's the best sunset, I think, in Texas, too. So uh, it's a great place for sunset. This is the one place that 
every time I've ever been out to the park, I've come here every time. And it's probably my favorite place on earth. Um, when I, I gave a version of this presentation in person for Linda, um, Linda's Happiness Hour at the Georgetown Photo Festival. And I mentioned that, I told my wife, I wanna have my ashes scattered here. And then I kind of thought about all the permits. When we got home, she's like, I'll scatter your ashes, but I'm not getting a damn permit <laughs> for, for out there. But um, yeah, this is just a beautiful place. Um, I, yeah, I, I love it. <clears throat> part three. So the third part is just the sweeping views that you get um, out in this part of the world that especially for someone who grew up uh, in Houston with pine trees everywhere blocking your views. Uh, you just, it's just rare in Texas, especially in a state that is 90% privately owned. So um, the, the parks out there are one of the few places where you can actually get away and get lost and just see forever and ever and ever. Um, like one example is Guadalupe Peak. Uh, this is the tallest point in Texas. It's a little over 8,000 feet. Um, and we're and this, from this vantage point, we're looking out over El Capitan, which is the peak in front of it. And uh, this was taken like right around sunrise. And this is another, another trip I took with my brother where um, <laughs> we, we just, someone needs to stop us. We, 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 we always get into trouble when we get these trips. And so on this trip, we were decided we wanted to camp up near the top. So we got a permit and we wanted to see sunrise from the top. So we backpacked up. Um, but then we decided we want to see stuff in the morning as well. So we didn't actually get on the trail to like one or two in the afternoon. It was June. And so over a hundred degrees and uh, we didn't bring nearly enough water. Um, I just, it seems like whenever we go out, it just seems like we're going to die. Like a lot of the time we, uh, we, 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 we don't plan well, I don't think. Um, but we survived, we got it back. And uh, we just had this incredible feeling of being on top of the world. Um, so it's, it's like an eight mile round trip hike. I definitely, I highly recommend it if, if you can swing it. Um, and up near the top, like this just picture cracks me up. This is like only in Texas y'all because there's these dang hitching posts for the horses like 8,000 feet up in the air. Like who does that? Um, but there they are. So this is the window, which, um, which is in Big Bend National Park and another contender I think for the best sunset in the state. Um, not Sotal Vista, but pretty darn close. It's also a good place for moon sets as well. And so this was taken in December when it was just freezing, freezing cold. Um, we got up super early, went up to the campsite, got ready to take the picture of the moon. We had planned it all out. And so we knew that the moon was going to set um, just directly centered through the window that morning. Um, like I said, we were up there for hours. I took a time lapse. And right as the moon started approaching the horizon, that's when clouds rolled in. So we never actually got our moon set picture. It was really, it was just, it was really heartbreaking. Um, we, we survived, but um, if I had had better Photoshop skills, I probably would have just stuck that moon into the horizon, but I, did, I don't, and I didn't. But um, yeah, it's a beautiful place, easily accessible as well. So this is a picture of, um, this is like the reddest I've ever seen in the sky ever. And so this was sunrise over a campsite in Pine Canyon in Big Bend National Park. And, um, and I mentioned this story at that other presentation, but uh, I'd set up camp, I was going out there solo. Um, I've gone out to the park a bunch of times solo. It's, it's kind of, it's an interesting experience being out by yourself in the park. and but I was out solo that trip and I just had this incredibly weird, uncomfortable sensation when I set up camp. And so I just couldn't bring myself to crawl into the tent that night. So instead I just slept in my car, which was, you know, not comfortable at all. But um, I had a great view of the stars that night because I couldn't sleep because it was cold and uncomfortable. But uh, early in the next morning, I um, saw this, this, sky break out red and it was just the most incredible like this is not photoshop this is not touched it just it looked like this uh that morning and uh it was just the uh the reddest darn sky i've ever seen 
Um, turns out someone was murdered at that site. So that's my other ghost story. Um, ghost lights and murders. That, that's it. Um, all the rest of the time, I felt very safe <laughs> whenever I've been out to these places, but except for those two times. And so this is Mulier's Peak, which is my absolute favorite mountain. Um, like the name just says it all. It's perfect. It's beautiful. And then this is Casa Grande, which is in Big Bend National Park. And this was also just a, a chance photograph one morning. Uh, I was breaking up, getting ready to come home. Um, it was cloudy, it had been cold, it had been rainy. It had been actually kind of a miserable trip. But right as I was leaving, um, this is up in the basin, the, uh, the clouds parted for just a minute and Casa Grande popped out and then got handed again. Again, um, looked terrible in color, but in black and white, um, it was a great picture. So part four. Um, there's a lot of hiking to be had. And so a lot of these pictures I'm gonna show are hikes. Um, if you're not a hiker, I mean, there's definitely photo opportunities and ways to enjoy, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, this one in particular, there was a hike that I've been planning for years. It was called the Dodson, Dodson with the D. <clears throat> and it cut across the heart of Big Bend National Park. Uh, right below, there's a range of mountains called the Chisos. And so it just cut across the base of the Chisos and just kind of transected that area below. So a lot of ups and downs and downs and ups, but no super steep stuff. And like I said, had said, this was a trip I've been planning forever. Um, the logistics had kind of set me back a little bit. Uh, just getting there is kind of a kind of an ordeal. But I was fortunate in the sense that again I was with my brother and he had busted his knee, so he couldn't really do the hike. So I had a shuttle that day. So he dropped me off at the trailhead, which was kind of an ordeal in itself. Getting there, um, he dropped me off. Um, as soon as he dropped me off, his car died. Um, so we, luckily it started up again and he made it out. But um, so I hiked this 10 mile trail and I was the only person out there. And this is probably the best hike I've ever been on. It was just like 10 miles of just solitude and just quiet and stillness and just wind and trees and birds and cactus. And it was just beautiful and lonely and exciting. It was just, it was just this perfect day. Um, I ended up being way, way later than um, anticipated. And so this was taken near the end of that trail um, around the same time that I was supposed to be meeting my brother at the rendezvous point, leaving him to worry and wonder that I had broken a leg and was dead in a ditch someplace. But um, we met. It was after dark. I gave him another heart attack, but um, it was all fine. But it's just beautiful. This is another part of the area that I feel like people don't go out there enough. And this is the Mesa Dangia. And so this is in Big Bend National Park as well. And it's on the far Western point. And uh, the Mesa is uh, right above Santa Alina Canyon. And there's a trail that goes up there. The trail is not terribly difficult, um, but it has these just incredible views of the river and these badlands and canyons. And uh, it's just great. Um, on this particular trip, we backpacked. As you can see, there's a tent down there. Um, we followed the trail for a little bit, and then the trail just kind of peters out, and you have to make your own way, which uh, I just found really appealing. That was just really exciting. You know, we just like, um, and we just kind of bushwhacked for for a day, just looking, trying our own, finding our own trail, and we found these canyons, and uh, it's just great. It's a, it's just a great place to explore. Um, not a lot of water. We had to stop and filter water up there, um, so that's something to be aware of, but it was just a beautiful trip. Um, funnily enough, uh, when, when we got back from this trip, uh, we got Slurpees someplace at some gas station. We treated ourselves and the attendant there said, oh, you boys just made it out in the nick of time because just the other day, a mountain lion mauled this German hiker. And like, oh, we were like, terrible. And so just for years, we've been telling the story that there's this, we just narrowly missed this mountain lion attack until I was researching it for this for this presentation, and I learned that that actually didn't happen. That <laughs> there was a mountain lion attack, but it was a Spanish hiker um, instead of German. The uh, 
the 7-Eleven guy said that she had thrown rocks at a mountain lion to get it, you know, to pose for her pictures. But in reality, she threw rocks at this mountain lion because it was attacking her, you know, to scare her away. And it didn't happen the day before it happened, like a year before we were up there. So, oh, well, it was, it was a great story, but another story ruined by the truth. Oh, well. So this is Pine Canyon, which is another trail. It's hard to get, it's a little harder to get to. Um, it's one of my favorite trails because it leads to this waterfall. Um, it doesn't run year round, but when it runs, it's one of the tallest in the state, well over a hundred feet. And it's always just this really special treat that um, like I never think to ask if the water's running. So it's always kind of a mystery if it's gonna be there or not. And so um, most of the times it's not been running the times I've been out there, but on this particular time, um, it was, and it's it's great, very cool. You know, it's like cooling mist comes down. It's a it's a great treat at the end of the hike. Then this is the aptly named Road to Nowhere, and so this is in Big Bend Ranch State Park. And on this particular trip, I was again solo, and I actually don't know what's at the end of this road <laughs> because I went up this long path. Um, I got here and uh, there's like this quarter mile stretch you can see where I was just, I don't know, I didn't want to run into somebody and like hit the back, like a quarter mile backwards against this slope and crush and roll down. So I chickened out, but someday maybe I'll figure out what's at the end of that road. Um, I don't know, if any of y'all have been out there, like, let me know what it is. Like, I'm curious. I mean, I could look at a map, but I'd, I'd rather find out someday. Hey, Rob, let me interrupt you for yeah. a couple of questions before you get too far off. Um, this goes to the waterfall. David's curious, are those water drops or are they sunspots on your lens? It's both. Um, there's a sun that's above the horizon, but those are water drops from the fall that um, landed on my lens. Okay. Um, Vernon's got a very good question. He wants to know if you've run into any rattlesnakes on the trails. <laughs> <laughs> bring down on, bring down on I, the trails, just in general. Have you run across any rattlesnakes? Not as many as I expected, uh, as I would have expected. A lot of the time, it's because I go out there in the winter months, um, between November and March, and snakes don't hibernate, but they go into, I forget the term, but they go into like a semi-dormant state. And so they're awake, but they're not out and about. And so just by the timing of the year that you go out there just is going, it reduces um, the chances of seeing them. That said, um, I'll, I'll get to it in one of the starry night pictures, but that was taken um, a trip I took out there in September one year. And just on the, on, on the roads, just driving on the roads, at one point, I think I counted seven, just like on the roads as I was driving at night. Um, so the answer is yes. So the answer is yes. Um, okay. I've never actually seen one on a trail though before. I've seen a couple times, I've seen a tail kind of slither off, but I, I don't know that it was a rattlesnake, but they're definitely out there. Um, Gail's got a, just a general question that, um, are the trails well marked? They are. Um, the Mesa Dangia one that I mentioned is not necessarily, it's a very, Rarely, um, there's a trail that goes up to a summit with an overlook, and that's very well marked, um, and then just kind of peters out. The rest of these that I've shown um, are very well marked. Um, one of the cool things I do like about the park is that there are some, for sure, off-limits places where either there's archaeological reasons to keep people out or ecologically um, fragile areas, they try and keep people out, but otherwise you're free to kind of roam. So if you want to explore, um, as long as you're not destroying things or tearing up the landscape, you're free to explore, which is just, I, I find really, really enjoyable. But by and large, the paths are pretty great in the national park. Um, Big Bend Ranch State Park, my experience has been mixed. Um, it's just not as well developed. And that's part of the charm for me is that it's not as well developed, but um, some of the paths are, um, you need some trail finding. You have to pay attention. There'll be rock markers, cairns, stuff like that. But um, it's not quite always so obvious for me in the state park as it is in the national park. And the same is true for Guadalupe Mountains National Park. Those trails are also really well marked. Okay. 
Um, Aaron's going to throw it out. She thinks the word is torpor. Does that ring she thinks the word is what? Torpor. Torpor for the snakes. The, she, oh, torpor. Yeah. That makes I'm sense. Sure. We'll go with her. She's pretty smart. She tells bad jokes, but she's pretty smart. <laughs> she's offset by the jokes. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That was a good interruption, though. No, I, I, uh, I'm, I, I prefer the interruptions. I don't like hearing myself talk in big stretches, so jump in. And so the last part are uh, the night skies, which I just, they're just like nothing else this poor city boy's ever seen, ever. Um, they're just incredible. And so I'm going to try and see if this works. Um, it does. So this is like the only overnight long-term time lapse I've ever shot successfully. Like I try a bunch, I mean, a bunch. Um, and I'm always just like fussing with the camera and yelling and screaming. And it's like, it's like, you know, in a Christmas story, like the dad is down in the furnace, like fighting with the furnace, rah, freaking freaking friend. That's me with my camera equipment. And something always goes wrong. Either like a gust of wind knocks the tripod over or the battery dies or like the card gets full and it just never works out except for this one. Um, and this was actually my first one. So I'm really, really happy that I've, I, I got one in my life. This was taken at Big Wind Ranch State Park, just right down the path from where my campsite was. It was just me and the coyotes that night. Um, it was just beautiful. <clears throat> but uh, a question I get asked sometimes is about the Milky Way in pictures. And people ask if it really looks like... Um, really looks like how it is in the pictures, and especially for people who haven't been out there before. And it's kind of a complicated answer um, because it is and it isn't in the sense that the camera can pick up so much more light than our eyes can pick up that uh, they see more even before photo, even before you might tweak the photo um, and kind of bring up some of the, uh, some of the, I don't know, the, the, the shadows and the colors and stuff like that, which I do. Um, I typically don't do composite photos, which is where you take a picture of the sky, take a picture of the foreground and try and marry them together. Um, I don't, I mean, I have before, um, and I've done that in the sense that I've done star trails where I'll take maybe a hundred pictures and then just kind of stack them all on top of each other to see this, the trails of the stars, or I may take five or six photographs and then just to get more enhanced resolution of the stars. But I don't particularly find like the act of composi comp ah, composing and compositing, there we go, um, compositing photos to be very interesting. Um, no judgments, if that's your thing, that's great, but um, that's just not my thing. So what I will do is adjust uh, like, tweak like the shadows, um, contrast, um, maybe bump the exposure a little bit. Um, but if you're asking like what the human eye sees, it won't look like that. Like this next picture here, this is the exact same photo um, as that first one straight out of the camera. And so this is what the camera would see um, without any edits whatsoever compared to, this is me where I tweaked a little bit. So this is pretty typical of the amount of tweaking I do for um, my star photos, uh, like I don't pretend to be an expert on it, but um, I mean, that's, that's a level I'm comfortable with. Um, some people go a lot more and that's great, but that's just me. Um, if I were to look at this same picture, um, like the sky wouldn't look that way to me. Um, you can see kind of there's like bright spots, that kind of creamy spot in the middle. I could see that that day, um, but it wasn't I couldn't see the, the kind of gas clouds over on the right of that, that the camera could see. So yes and no. Um, this one, this is kind of a weird picture of the show, but uh, the reason I picked it is just, I noticed the, uh, the stars in my hood, reflection in my hood of my car that I just never noticed that before. So that's why I took this, but um, <clears throat> this is a picture again on, so uh, taken at Solo Vista. And this was in the summer one year. And so, like I mentioned that the summer is the storm season. And so I was really lucky in that the Milky Way was out in the sense that we could see it through the clouds there, but then there was also a storm raging on the horizon in um, 
And it's just this incredible juxtaposition of the lightning and the rain and the stars, um, which was common for that entire trip in, uh, in July that year. This is another picture. It's not a Milky Way shot per se, although you can see uh, an arm of the Milky Way in the tent behind us. Um, and this time of year, this was taken during the Great Conjunction, which was December of 2020. And that was when Jupiter and Saturn were very close to each other. Um, they're actually camera left, not, <laughs> not pictured. But uh, the reason I like this, there's a number of reasons why I like this, but uh, like, I feel like a lot of times we get hung up on taking Milky Way shots out there, which are great, but you know, there's only a couple months of the year that the core of the Milky Way is visible and that there's just a lot of neat things to see in the sky um, outside of that. And so just the billions and billions and zillions of stars um, in and of themselves, I think is just an incredible sight. Um, Lately, I've been taking less photos of the stars because I've just been wanting to enjoy them, to be honest, just lay out and just watch them, look for satellites, look for shooting stars. Um, yeah, I just find it very peaceful. Um, real quick question. Yeah. Um, it might have been the photo before the tent, but I might be wrong. So if I'm wrong, David, correct me. He's wanting to know, did you light paint the foreground? I did not, actually. Um, I've tried light painting with limited success. Um, in this case, I think this was the moon, um, if I remember correctly. So the moon was setting maybe like 40, this was taken fairly soon after sunset. Um, the sun had gone down and I believe the moon had gone down um, maybe a, a little bit after that. And so I think that's just moonlight, if I remember correctly, um, in the foreground. Yeah, light painting, painting the foreground, that's, I've done that a couple of times. I enjoy it, but I don't think I'm very good at it. And I also forget to bring a flashlight half the time. So um, I'm just not great at it. Um, no, you're, you're not. I've been with you a couple of times and you are not. <laughs> yeah, I'm just not. Um, maybe I'll put that on my 2023 resolution to learn how to light paint stuff. Um, yeah, it always just gets like overexposed and bright and burnt out. It's just... I'm like what are you what is he doing over there now yeah it just, it just never works out um yeah but <clears throat> so this is the basin uh road to the basin um yeah this is just one of my favorite pictures so this is a picture uh usually when i take astro stuff it's usually pretty wide angled um i have a i, I shoot canon it doesn't matter but you know what brand it is but i have a 15 to 35 2.8 lens. That is my kind of go-to astrophotography lens. And this one in particular, I was just trying something different. So I, this one was shot with a 24 to 70 and zoomed in at 70 millimeters. And so that's, um, that's usually more telephoto than I would prefer. Um, the, the reason that I prefer, and most people prefer kind of wide angle is that the apparent movement of the stars is really amplified when you when you zoom in. And so when it's a wide field of focus, the stars are still moving, of course, but it's not quite as obvious. Um, the more and more zoomed in you go, the quicker the exposure has to be or else you start getting uh, inadvertent star trails. And so this is probably, I forget, this was maybe five or six seconds, um, which is about pushing it. Um, the stars were a little blurry, but um, good enough. Um, I also like it because it looks like George Washington kind of pondering eternity, you know, laying on his back, stroking his chin um, as he stares up at the sky, that little mountain there. And this one is a more traditional lens. This is 15 millimeter uh, taken from the same spot, the same night, and uh, <clears throat> just a different, um, if, if, if we were to zoom in, the stars would be a lot more um, cleaner and pinpricks. Uh, the lens I have is not great. It's not known as being a sharp lens. So uh, I'm never going to have razor, razor sharp images with my stars, but um, it would be a lot more in focus than, or uh, a lot sharper than the 70 was before that. And then this is, uh, this is actually an example of stacking. So this is five or six photos that I stacked together. And uh, I did that just to bring out and capture more detail and reduce the kind of ISO noise that creeps into photographs. And so these are five or six pictures and then stacked with a computer to kind of blend them all together and then 
composited. So this is this is a composite photo um, in the sense that um, I it's it's the landscape got you know basically masked in. It's the same landscape, but just the way the stacking works that um, it looked goofy unless I had to pick one and mask it in. Um, but that's my maybe only example of a composite. That's it. Thanks, y'all. Um, if you want to connect with me, like Linda mentioned, my website is Pluto911, and my Instagram handle is also Pluto911. Um, do y'all have any questions? Any other questions that yeah. didn't come up? Yeah, I've, I've got a, there's a, there's a real question, and then there's going to be Linda questions in here. All so, right. <laughs> so uh, kudos on the time lapse from a couple of people in here. Um, <laughs> Thanks. One, of the, one of the questions, I think it's David wanted to know, um, uh, maybe maybe some tips on time lapses, but he his question is your camera panned and, and took the time lapse. So uh, I, I think the answer is yes, because I know the equipment you're using, but do you have um, any um, quick tips that you can share? Yeah. And so the time lapse, the biggest thing um, that you really have to plan for, in my mind, is batteries. Uh, because if you're just using your normal camera batteries and you want to have it run all night, it's not going to work. Um, especially if you're using mirrorless cameras, if you have a mirrorless camera, because that really eats up the batteries. And so what I have are, I usually have a couple battery packs. And the tricky part is, at least for mine and for the Canon, is that I've noticed that not all of the camera battery packs, not all, you know, I'm talking about like the USB, like juice packs, just the standard ones, is that at a certain point, they don't provide enough voltage to keep the camera awake. And so um, I forget the brand, but I found a couple brands over time that do provide a constant voltage that keeps the camera awake. And so um, once I kind of zoned in on that, it made my life a lot easier for capturing long-term time lapses. As far as the panning goes, I do use uh, an old SERP Genie, a mini Genie, um, which is kind of, it looks like a hockey puck. And so it has a rotary motor that slowly rotates around. And that is synced up with an intervalometer that I use. I use a uh, time-lapse plus, um, I believe the brand is, it's a, it was a Kickstarter and a time-lapse view is what it is. And so it's great. It actually is really great. Um, it's great. It does what's called um, auto ramping. And so that as the sky gets darker, like you might start your sun, your picture around sunset. And as the sun goes down, it gets darker, darker, darker. It will increase the shutter speed and the ISO to match and compensate for the darkness. So that's a huge benefit and makes things a lot easier when it works. Um, like I have problems getting it talking to the mini genie for the panning. And so that causes frustration, but um, yeah, between the intervalometer and the mini genie and the battery pack, those are the three things that um, you really need to um, get set up and figure out and like remember how it all works before you can do like those long term time lapses. Um, Susan's wanting to know are drones allowed in any of the parks? Do you know? Are what allowed? Drones. They're not, um, none. <laughs> National Park, State Park. Uh, if you have a permit, sure. Um, otherwise, no dice. Out of luck, yeah. Um, I'm, I didn't see any other questions. I do have one. Um, I've, I've question about uh, Sand Atlantic Canyon. First of all, you didn't show my rock. I don't understand why that's not part of your presentation. <laughs> So mm -hmm. you, you get an A minus. Okay. Um, secondly, Santa Elena Canyon is awesome. And you admitted to me <laughs> when you went down with me, hey, this isn't that bad. Um, you were the, you know this, you're the reason that I went to Big Bend, you and Tim Spear. Uh, Tim Spear is a gentleman that um, I followed on, uh, I follow on Instagram. And between the two of you, I had never seen a red sunset sunrise I, I really thought it was um smoke and mirrors and photoshop tricks and um you guys both convinced me i needed to go out there so my first trip out there was because of you and you sat down with me and um plotted on and shared your google map and and told me what my car could 
uh, what roads I could go <laughs> over my car and what uh, roads to stay off of. So um, I thank you for that because I've been to Big Bend several times and actually you and I've gone out there together. So that was a, that was a lot of fun and it was a great experience. Um, one of the things I noticed is, or I, it's just maybe I, uh, maybe I fell asleep, but I've never seen any of those black and white pictures you you shared, and those are really, really beautiful. <laughs> really yeah, beautiful. I don't, yeah, I don't know why. I don't. I'm, I just I have stacks of them, um, and I, I actually do that with a bunch of my photos. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll do that too. That I just kind of like look at and realize these might actually look really cool, especially like the, like I was saying, the terrible ones, like the ones that are taken midday or like that awful two hours before sunset when it's just the absolute worst light of the day. Like those are always candidates in my mind for black and whites. Well, now I need to go back through all my awful ones and see what I can do because they really, you know, I, I know you've been out there, I don't know, 20 times, 30 times. Yeah, you go way more than anybody I know. Um, in my mind, I've already been three times. I don't really need to go back. There's so many other places, but um, there were several of those big wide vista landscape shots that I'm very, very envious of. And I'm like, dang it, now I have to go back, back out. <laughs> it's a really long drive. It's a, it's a tough drive for me. So um, thank you for sharing those because those are really, really cool. Um, you and I were out there um, shooting sunset. Um, it's Sulta Vista. And if anybody wants to hear Rob gasp, it's when that sun started, we had gold light. It was pretty phenomenal. I'm like, is that yeah. it? And I hear Rob, <laughs> yeah, that's like, what do you mean? <laughs> what else are you expecting? This is fantastic. And it really, really, it's a beautiful place to do sunset, but it's equally as beautiful at sunrise mm -hmm. because um, I, that's one of those places I didn't expect to get a shot at both times of the day and the color in both of yeah. them. Yeah, you guys got like Milky Way shots over there, right? Yeah, my first trip out there, um, I no the second trip out there. I got Milky Way shots uh, right off right off of the that right out of the parking lot. That's what we're we're, yeah. we're doing. Yeah, it's so. almost like cheating. It's so so easy to get I there, and it's just like bam. I know I, you know people see those pictures and they ooh and ah, and I'm just like I don't want to tell them that you know I'm literally in the parking lot next to like the only real kind of bathroom and the only place that you can kind of get a cell signal. <laughs> So it is cheating, but it's, it's definitely worth it. So if you haven't been to Big Bend, consider adding it to, to your um, travel list um, because the stars alone, um, Big Bend is one of the darkest skies in our country uh, for sure. I don't know what the ranking is, but it's up there. If it's not the darkest sky, um, the, um, I'm seeing a question from David Wilson. He's wanting to know what time of year is best for Milky Way shots. I think um, in the Northern hemisphere, which I'm assuming most of us, that's what we care about is late February is when it starts showing. If you're prepared to get up like in the dead of night, like two, 3 AM. Um, yeah. Like Linda, um, not so much me, uh, it starts getting rising earlier and earlier as the months progress. Uh, by So by the time June rolls around, then it's pretty short quickly after sunset. Um, that's probably the easiest time to take pictures of the Milky Way. Uh, it goes away in August or September, depending on how, I think it's September, depending on how things play out is the absolute last time you can see it. And even then it's only visible for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Um, that late in the season. So between February and September um, are the only chances you have to see the core. I mean, there's always, the Milky Way is always up there. There's always a branch or an arm in the sky, but for the core, which is like the beautiful gas cloud in the middle, like that's only from February to September. Um, I didn't see any photos in your presentation, but have you ever been out there during um, Desert Bloom? I have. Uh, that time in seventh grade when I was a kid was spring break. So that was March. And uh, it's beautiful. It's it's hard because that is, it's hard in the sense that's about the most popular time of the year because it's, you know, kids are out for school vacation. 
the weather is beautiful. Everything's in bloom. So it's really popular. So it's hard um, finding a camping spot um, or a reservation or a hotel reservation, but um, it is beautiful. The Asatio is in bloom, the cactus is in bloom. It's great. I bet you can get a room at the Tarantula Ranch. <laughs> you probably could. <laughs> For any of you guys, um, if do not stay at Tarantula Ranch. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of one of those private, scary jokes, but for uh, Rob Doyle, John Fisher, Chris Fitch, um, who knows what would have happened to, to, to us out there. But um, anyway, Rob, thank you for doing this presentation. Um, you know, I appreciate you. And, and, and um, Rob is one of those people that um, got me out there, got me interested in going to West Texas. Um, so hopefully if you have any questions that you didn't get in tonight, reach out to him through social media, because I guarantee you, he will respond, respond to you. It might be sarcastic, um, <laughs> but he will respond to you. All right, Rob, anything else that you want to, anything you forgot or anything you want to say before I shut down the session? No, thanks for having me. This was fun. Um, I really appreciate it and appreciate the questions. Absolutely. All right. Uh, again, if you guys want to connect with Rob, you can at Pluto911.com and on Instagram at Pluto911. Next week, we are off. I, I'll be out. Um, I'm out of the country right now. I'm going to be roaming a little bit deeper into some rainforest. So the Wi-Fi is going to be too weak to support a Zoom call. But join us on Wednesday, April 27th, when Gina Yao shares her presentation, the Passion Within, from mom photographer to landscape photographer. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.